Bibles, if you would please, to the book of Amos. And everybody looked at me like I hit him in the face with a wet dish rag. What? You'd never preach out of Amos. Guilty as charged. But I got a word this week out of Amos. The word actually came to me as I was lying in the hospital for the week. You knew that was going to happen. You know that God works all things together for the good of those who love the Lord. And this won't be stories about hospitals and stories about, you know, surgeries. I, I often refer to that as an organ recital. You know, old people get together and talk about all their organs they've had taken out. I call that an organ recital. Well, I'm not going to do that today. But I will tell you that that happened, that, that this word came to me while I was in the hospital. Amos 8, 11. And read three verses. I'm reading from the NIV because it read the clearest. I read all the translations I have and I chose this one because it communicated the best. Amos 8, 11 through 13, NIV says this. The days are coming. Are you with me? The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord. Doesn't that read well? The sovereign Lord. When I will send a famine throughout the land. Well, that's nothing new. We've heard about famines when people disobeyed God and the heavens became, became uh, dried up and the earth became brass and no food would grow and they experienced great famines. But this is a different kind of famine. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine throughout the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water. But what? But a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. I'm calling this sermon a famine of the word. A famine. I'm, I'm, see, I'm getting hungry, hungry already for the word, just thinking about the fact that if the word wasn't available... How hungry I'd be spiritually. How dry I would become. How awful that would be. Verse 12. Men will stagger from sea to sea. It's, it's amazing. You think about this. He, he's talking about a famine of hearing the word. Which is going to cause men to stagger. From sea to sea. And wander from north to east. Searching for the word of the Lord. But they will not find it. And verse 13 says, In that day the lovely young women and strong young men will faint because of thirst. Look up here for a moment. What I discovered when I lay in the hospital for a week and people came in and out and I had different, what do you call it, uh, someone in the bed next to you, your roommate, yeah. Different folks, three different roommates in that time. Not one time in a week did anybody say anything about Jesus, about God, about the Holy Word of God, not one single time. And I thought to myself, boy, this is what it's like to be in a famine, a famine of the Word. And then it dawned on me as I was praying about this, and I knew it was a word that I needed to bring to the church and to the greater church at large. I realized that, see, I don't live a normal life. <laughs> the amen goes there. I immerse myself in the word. I surround myself with people that love to talk about the word. And we fellowship with the word. And I realized many of you go to a, a place of business, in an office, in a in, in cubicle like Carrie does. Cubicle, sweet cubicle. And what is experienced there is what I experienced in the hospital. The world is experiencing a famine of the word. Now remember... The founding fathers, the people that put together this nation, that left uh, religious oppression to come and have religious freedom. They didn't come here for turkey dinner. How many know what I'm talking about? They came here to experience the freedom to worship God. The freedom to express their worship of God. And through the years, our founding fathers of the 55 delegates to the 1787 Constitutional Convention 
49 were Protestants, 3 were Roman Catholics. Among the Protestant delegates to the Constitutional Convention, 28 were Church of England or Episcopalian after the American Revolutionary War was won, 8 were Presbyterians, 7 were Congregationalists, 2 were Lutherans, 2 were Dutch Reformed, 2 were Methodists. A few prominent fathering fathers were anti-clerical Christians, which cracks me up. Sounds like early non-denominational to me, you know what I'm talking about? They didn't like the way things were done, but they were Christians and they wanted the Holy Word of God. Thomas Jefferson, who created the so-called Jefferson Bible, and Benjamin Franklin, and a few others, most notably Thomas Paine, were deists. At least they had held beliefs in God. And many of their documents, if you read your history, started off in the year of our Lord, 1776. When's the last time we heard that out of Congress? We declare in the year of our Lord, 2012, this new law or this new legislation. When's the last time we heard that? We're in a famine of the Word of God. Indeed, the Constitution ends with these very poignant words. Let me read a whole, the last chapter of the U.S. Constitution. You don't, you don't mind, do you? Amen. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world. Oh, wouldn't that be refreshing to hear coming out of our Congress. For the rectitude of our intentions do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. Sorry, honey. <laughs> She's Scottish, you know. And that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conduct, uh, conclude peace, contract alien, uh, alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And check this out. I love this last line. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. That's God, in case you don't recognize the wording back in the, the, the 1700s. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. With a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence to each other, our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Wouldn't that be wonderful to hear such a, de a declaration coming out of our houses of Congress? Amen? Amen? Or any political group. Here is one of the major reasons we're in a famine of the word. The phrase separation of church and state. Now don't raise your hands because I don't want you to embarrass yourselves. But how many think or how many have been taught that that phrase is in the Constitution? Many people have been taught. Many people believe. Many people act as if separation of church and state is in the Constitution. It is not in the Constitution. It was actually in a letter written by Thomas Jefferson trying to assure the Danbury Baptists, I have the letter, I'm going to read it to you. Trying to assure the Danbury Baptists that this new federal government would not imp it, uh, impede their religious beliefs. I mean, after all, they, they left by, with, with great peril another nation and, and formed this nation for freedom of religion, freedom to worship. And the Danbury Baptists were, were concerned and wrote to their uh, representative, Thomas Jefferson. And here's what he said. To Messrs. Nehemiah Dodge, what a great name, Nehemiah Dodge, <laughs> Ephraim Robbins and Stephen S. Nelson, a committee of the Danbury Baptist Association of the State of Connecticut, gentlemen. The affectionate sentiments of esteem and approbation which you are so good as to express towards me on behalf of the Danbury Baptist Association give me the highest satisfaction. My duties dictate a faithful and zealous pursuit of the interests of my constituents and in proportion as they are persuaded of my fidelity to those duties, the discharge of them becomes more and more pleasing. In other words, thanks for, thanks for the respect. Right back at you, bro. Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, 
that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law. Check this out. The legislature should make how many laws? No, no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. First Amendment. That is part of our Constitution. That the government should not limit, should not make a law as respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise. Are you getting this? That's the law. So when somebody tells you something other than this, say no. You are wrong. The Constitution what takes, keeps the government out of our free expression of religion. Doesn't tell us that we can't speak in schools. Doesn't tell us that we can't speak in the public square. Doesn't tell us that we can't express our opinion at work. It goes on to say in his, his, his wording. He says, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Not in the Constitution. It's in the letter, letter to the Danbury Baptists. And yet liberals everywhere politicians everywhere point to that and say see you have to have a separation of church and state phooey if anything it's supposed to be keep the government out of our religion we are a sovereign and we are free to exercise our faith we need to know this because this is the very first thing that has really put up a famine in the word of God from this point all of a sudden people are suing to get the nativity scene off a of public square. That's crazy. Suing to not have the word of God read in a public place. Or prayers in a public place. That's crazy. Blessed to the nation. Blessed is a nation whose God is God. And, and, and sin is a reproach to any nation. Remove God. Remove morality. And we cannot possibly live in a free country. There have to be laws. There has to be moral character. Amen? Amen? Has to be. See, I remember as a kid a lot more freedom of expression of scripture. I remember on Christmas Eve December uh, in 1968 I was 11 years old in what was the most watched television broadcast up to that time of all time. The crew of Apollo 8 were circling the moon. Anybody remember this? And I remember, you know, watching and listening. I think it was black and white. <laughs> I watched it on my iPad. Not. <laughs> I think I watched it on the family black and white television downstairs. I think it's my idea. With a Reynolds wrap on the antenna trying to get it to come in. Yeah, it was a little fuzzy. <laughs> the crew of Apollo 8 read in turn from the book of Genesis as they orbited the moon. Bill Anders... Jim Lovell and Frank Borman recited verses 1 through 10 using the King James Version. I happen to bring a transcript. You want to hear it? Beep. You know, they always had that beep because it was recording. Beep. We are now approaching the lunar sunrise. And for all the people back on Earth, the crew of the Apollo 8 has a message that we'd like to send to you. Remember, this was the most watched television broadcast of all time up until that time. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I remember getting a particular tingling sensation when I heard those words. The word of God is powerful. And here they were reading it from the moon to the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And then Jim Lovell took over. You know, they're look, peering out their window and seeing that beautiful, looks like a big, giant, beautiful blue marble of the earth and the atmosphere and the clouds, and they're seeing us as they're reading how God created. Jim Lovell said, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament beep, in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And people all around the world were listening and hearing 
and taking in the Word of God. And then Frank Borman took over for the final segment. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. See, it's scriptural to cruise, you see. In the, in the seas. And God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo White, we close with a good night, good luck, and a Merry Christmas. And God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Remember that? Man, that was amazing. Do we hear that ever? No. Because we're in a famine of the word of God in this country. Where else do I see a famine of the word? You'll be surprised. I see a famine in the word in some of your lives. I really do. How, how do I know this? What do you mean, Pastor? Well, when I have extended conversations with some of you, not all of you, but with some of you, not once do you mention the scriptures. Not once do you talk about the word of God. And you know what that tells me? The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I want you to turn to a verse in Luke, Luke chapter 6. I want you to know this is how I recognize that there's a famine in the word, even in Christians around us. And this ought not be so. When we talk, the word of God ought to be part of our conversations. God the Father and Jesus, whom we appreciate so much, ought to be a part of what we talk about and testify about. Even the word halal, which we get the word hallelujah, means to talk about God and talk about his great works. And in so doing, we're giving praise. I hear no praise from some quarters. Luke 6, 44, if you would please. I'm going to read several verses because they're good. The before and the after. Luke 6, 44, Jesus said this, for every tree is known by its own fruit. I could stop there and we could go home. No, don't. <laughs> but seriously, fruit are the things that you say. I'll prove it in a moment. The things that you do. Every tree is known by its own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush do they gather grapes. Here it is, verse 45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. Treasure of his heart. I'll read that in a different translation in a moment. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart is filled with anything but the word of God. Entertainment, things that are going on, news, anything but the word of God. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance, here it is, for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. It's true, isn't it? The things you think about all day are the things that when a conversation starts are the things that you talk about. And I'm not hearing the word of God from some quarters. This has got to change. And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Let me read just verse 45 in the NIV. Check it out. This is so good. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. Stored up. What's stored up in your heart? Sports statistics? Entertainment? News? How about the word of God? Where is it? If it's there, it'll come out out of the abundance of the heart. If you don't have enough, it's not coming out because it's not abundant. Change. Change. Fill your heart. Don't let there be a famine in your own heart. Because it goes on to say, out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith, hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Pastor, what can I do? What can I do? How can I fill my heart with the Word of God? Three things. This is my second to last point. I'm getting out of order here. I'll have to remember to go back and do my other point. Number one, fill your heart with the Word of God. How? Study. When's the last time you actually studied the Bible? I don't have a study Bible, Pastor. Get one. It's the most important thing in your life. Get a study Bible that will show you what's going on and explain things. Listen to the word on CD. Here's a great thing I did the other day. 
We got an iPad 2 when the iPad 1s came out because they're really expensive, but the iPad 2s went down. So I got the iPad 2. And the Verhands told me about the Bible Gateway app. And I found it and I downloaded it. It is marvelous. It has all these different Bible translations. And one afternoon when I was recovering and I was sitting outside, it was one of those warm days in March. Remember those? <laughs> it was like a long time ago now. And I turned to the book of Ephesians and I saw where it said it would read it to me. Hallelujah. I hit play and I listened to the whole book of Ephesians. They just read it to me. Why don't you do that? You can. Fill yourselves. Fill yourselves. I was reminded of all the great stuff that was in the book of Ephesians. It, it talks about how God throughout eternity will lavish upon us his love and show us from age to age his goodness. Mmm. Mmm. I got that just hearing the Ephesians read to me. That was in the second chapter. Man. Fill yourself. And then out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. What else can I do, Pastor? You can have the internet read you the word like I had there. You can, ready, ready? You can memorize the Bible. Pastor, I can't memorize. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Have you memorized your phone number? Your social security number? Your house number? The name of your street? Do you have to look it up every time you go home? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait where's it? I live on what, where, on what street? You got that memorized. Why? Because it's important to you. You can memorize the Bible. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You memorized your kids' birthdays. <laughs> Hopefully your spouse is in your anniversary. <laughs> there are many ways that you can fill yourself with the Word of God. And I say, do it. Do it. Number two, how do I fix this famine? Well, actually, now I'm, now I'm getting into not only fixing the famine in my heart, but fixing the famine in the world. Well, let me come back to number two by going back to the thing that I skipped. Are you confused? Hallelujah. So am I. What is the solution to this famine of the word in the world? You know what the solution is? You and me. The solution to the famine of the word is you. Because you can fill yourself with the word of God. You can become that gospel that people read. You can be the one. Carrie was telling me that uh, last night that when she's at work, she starts talking about the word of God. She said people gather around and listen with fascination. As she's teaching them some of the things she's heard and learned at church. They listen with fascination. Why? Because the word of God is alive and powerful and it feeds people's spirits. They don't hear it so they don't know. When they do hear it, they're like, wow. Wow, that, that's really interesting. The solution to the famine is not only me preaching the word here and having it go out over cable. I know you guys watched it this morning on Comcast at 8 o'clock. That's awesome. They almost didn't come to church today thinking, well, we've already had church. <laughs> no. No, that was Paul. All right, never mind. That wasn't Tracy. Tracy wasn't even tempted. But you can do the same thing. You can promote the word. You can give the word. Turn, if you would please, in your Bible to Mark chapter 16. And I read several excellent verses before I finish my points 1, 2, and 3. Because they, they, they dovetail together, really. Mark chapter 16. It's considered the Great Commission. Verses 14. Usually 16, 15. But I'm going to start with verse 14. So if you want to memorize where the Great Commission is, think Mark 16, 15. 16, 15. But I'm going to start in verse 14. And he, who's the he we're talking about? This is Jesus. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Folks, that command has not changed. We're still under that same commandment. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who has believed and is baptized shall be saved. He who is disbelieved shall be condemned. I'm reading from the New American Standard. Great version. And these signs shall accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. 
If they pick up serpents or drink any deadly poison, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they might recover. Did I misquote that? And they shall recover. Keep going. So then when Jesus, the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of God, and they, what did they do? They stayed home and watched the tigers. I like watching the tigers. But if my whole life was watching the tigers, I don't have time to fulfill the great com commission. So I have to do things in a balance, in moderation. Verse 20, and they went out and they preached everywhere. How can I preach, pastor? Well, do like Carrie does in the cubicle. Start talking about stuff. I know people that use Facebook and put a scripture or two or testimony. Yeah, you can do that. You can do that. I know people that buy Bibles to give away or buy good books of good testimonies to give away because if you don't have time to preach or that person's not listening to you preach, you know, but if they're fascinated with the word, oh, I got this great translation. I call it Bible for Blinds. It's the New Living Testament. Here, let me give you one. We've done that to waitresses. I've done that with people right here in the church. And they take these Bibles home and they read them. And they learn because it's a more modern translation that they get. Or Linda will be working in her studio doing nails and talking about, you know, I heard about this boy who uh, had a death experience and saw heaven and came back and told his daddy about it. And he knew things that he couldn't possibly have known unless he had actually seen it. And it's a little yellow book, she'll say, called the uh, Heaven is Real. And her clients will get interested. We bought several copies. We got a couple copies sitting in the shelf right now that when they say, oh, that's really fascinating, she'll get it out and she'll give it to them. That's preaching the gospel. That's spreading the word. As much as telling them. You can give them reading materials. You can post on Facebook. You can send an email. You can be at family gatherings. And while they're talking about this and that over there, you can talk about, you know, God really blessed me because this and this happened and I did this and God just really blessed me. And it fascinates people. But if you're not preaching the gospel, if you're not doing any of these things, giving away books, Bibles and things, or preaching or sharing or doing anything on Facebook, you're not obeying the Lord Christ. You're not obeying Jesus. He said, go into all the world. And as you're going, one translation says, preach the gospel to every creature. I believe that once we get to heaven and there's tears wiped from eyes, I believe some of the tears will be tears of remorse and regret. Because we'll get there and say, I didn't preach the gospel. I heard about it that Sunday morning. I was given opportunities. I was given even ideas. I didn't do it. Sorry, Lord. I don't want to say, sorry, Lord. And I don't think you do either. Amen? Amen. We are the solution to the famine of the, wor of, the, of the word. Verse 20, one more time. Mark 16, 20. They went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word with signs following. So as you preach, expect miracles and answers to prayer. Don't expect miracles and answers to prayer as we just sit in our little church, us four no more, not preaching the gospel, Lord, please give me a miracle. No, it's supposed to be accompanying the word going out. You want more miracles? Do a little more preaching of the gospel. Let the word go out. So what do I do? Number one, fill your heart with the word of God. I already said that. You can memorize the Word of God. You've memorized many things. Memorize it. Even if you don't know chapter and verse where it's found, you'll know the stuff. Frances Hunter was really amazing like that. She'd get up to preach. And she'd quote all kinds of verses. But she couldn't, she didn't know where they were in the Bible, but at least she knew the stuff. She knew the content. And she would always talk about the Word of God. And people got saved and healed and baptized in the Spirit. Number two, Number one, fill your heart. Number two, buy Bibles and good testimony books to give away as you're telling God about people about God's kindness to you. And number three, support. What do you, what do you say? Time, talent, and treasure. Support not only this church, which is preaching the gospel, but support other ministries that preach the gospel. I recommend the Billy Graham Association. Those guys are on fire preaching the gospel. Billy Graham's son, Franklin, is amazing. I read an article about the grandson this week, too. He's amazing. These guys are preaching the gospel, something fierce. Support him. 
time, talent, and treasure. Support with your money, support with your time, the church here, and, and your, your talent. And let me give you a last verse I'm going to close with. Back in the Old Testament, I'm going to give you something really amazing that you maybe hadn't thought about. First Samuel. Wow, Pastor, you start with the Old Testament and with the Old Testament today. Well, you know, got to rip it up. <laughs> got to do something different. Got to rattle the rafters and rip up the carpet once in a while. Do something different. How God does so once in a while. First Samuel, I'll give you a moment to find it. It's King David. And they've just gone out and done a raid and gotten their wives and their children back. And they got a whole bunch of spoil from the one of the ites, the Malachites or somebody. And they brought home all these goods. And the people, the guys that went to battle, when they came back, they didn't want to share with the people that were too sickly and too weak and stayed with the stuff. That's a good King James word. Did you know that words in the Bible? Stuff is a King James word. So I'm going to read from the King James. Here's the principle. It said in verse, it's 1 Samuel 30, 22. Then answered all the wicked men and said of Belial, the men of Belial, all those that went with David and said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we've recovered except to give back their wives and children that they might lead them away and depart. But David, man, what a heart. Heart as big as God's almost. A heart after man's, God's own heart. Then David said, this you shall not do, my brethren, with that which the Lord has given us, who has preserved us and delivered the company that came against us in our hand, to our hand. For all who will hearken unto you in this matter, but as his part that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part that tarrieth by the stuff. <laughs> Those of you who went down and risked your lives and got all this battle and, uh, and, and spoil, you're going to share with those that were too sick to go or too weak to go. They shall take part alike. And so it was from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel to this day. Pastor, why is that important? It's because every time you give to this ministry, every time you give to Billy Graham's ministry, and we preach the gospel or they preach the gospel, you share in the rewards because you were empowering. You were helping and that's one of the ways also to preach the gospel. But do not let your own personal responsibility fall. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel. You can do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. Thank you that it makes us wise unto salvation. Thank you, Lord, that it tells us what we need to do. Before we get to heaven, Lord, we need these instructions. We need to know that it is our job to end the famine of the word. And the famine of the word is here partly because we have not done our job. Forgive us, Lord. Give us opportunities. We will fill our hearts. We will testify. We will give away good reading materials containing the word of God. We will use all the electronic media to spread the word of God. We will share from heart to heart and person to person and therefore end the famine of the word of God. We declare this unto you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.